So hello, I'm John Gribben. We've at IW uh, a car tea meeting in Tampa, Florida, and we've just come out of the CLL session, although we're going to cover some stuff that isn't CLL related. We had a usual combination of uh, live speakers and, and virtual speakers, but I'm joined today by my two colleagues who were li talking to us live. That's Sarah Gill from University of Pennsylvania, and Mazier uh, Shadman from Fred Hutch, so in Seattle. So, uh, great session, guys. So. Let's talk about it. So, Sar, let's start with you. Um, CLL, of course, um, we were just discussing almost the very first patients that we saw the promise of CAR T, and here we are, you know, long time later with still no approved product. So, what's the challenge that, what's the biggest challenge that we face in seeing an approved product where we can see there's such tantalizing efficacy, but all was just not quite there? Yeah, thanks, John. I think, uh, well, I think there are two major challenges. The first one has been on the clinical response front. And I think that while the first few cases were very exciting, had high response rates in a small number of patients, and then most importantly, extremely durable with some recent reports of uh, patients now 10 years out, we're still with circulating, still active CAR T cells, still with B-cell aplasia telling you that those T-cells are functional and likely protecting the patients from relapse, those were a minority of patients. And then there was actually somewhat of a, I think, a, a disappointing lull in, in clinical activity in, in really from several different centers, several different products. And um, while that was happening, there was a surge of activity in ALL and lymphoma. And, and, and that's how we sort of got to this situation where we are now. But I think addressing that ch clinical challenge is um, perhaps now we're seeing better responses, perhaps uh, quite good response rates with, with lysocell, for example, as monotherapy, but as I showed in my presentation and has been presented and published by a couple of other groups as well, rational combinations um, with CAR T cells and CLL, and by rational I mean so, uh, an agent that does not disrupt the activity of the T cells and indeed may even immunomodulate. Um, are now leading to very high response rates, and those response rates are, are very durable and are associated with extremely deep responses in the order of less than one in, ten, one in a million cells. So that's the first challenge. The second one is, what is the, on the other side of the equation, what is the competition, if you like? What, is the, what are the alternatives? And I think that talking to other hematologists, oncologists, talking to patients, uh, talking to companies, there is always the, the retort, well, y these results might be really good, but we have many effective agents for CLL. And so, and, and so I think that's the other challenge is, what is the alternative? Is there an unmet medical need or not? I would say yes, but some would say no. Yeah, I mean, in CLL, the, the data has clearly shown that since ibrutinib and venetoclax came along, the number of aloe transplants has really fallen off. But of course, the problem with aloe transplant in CLL has always been the vast majority of the patients really just not terribly fit for it. But is it just a time before, you know, patients eventually become resistant even to these new therapies that we have? And, um, you know, when is the ideal window to be offering these types of therapies? Is it always going to fail if we waited until the patients have failed everything and they've got, you know, really bulky disease? Or do we need to think about an optimal time that an immunotherapy like a CAR-T approach can work in these groups of patients? Now maybe come back to both of you on, on this one. So let's start with you. Sure. Uh, I think in clinical immunotherapy, one of the challenges is to take care of patients specifically with CLL diagnosis and, and mantle cell lymphoma. And as you mentioned, one of the most common problems is that these patients are mainly offered, uh, referred to us when they have active disease with progressive disease. So uh, to, to get to your question of what is the right time for considering CAR-T, I think when disease is responsive, but either because of disease parameters or because of the prior treatments, you consider the patient high risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always encourage patients uh, having a consultation at least talking about CAR-T therapy and cellular therapy approaches when we know that one of the novel agents is no longer an option for them, sure. BTK inhibitors or venetoclax. In real world though, that doesn't happen. So we usually get patients after the two major classes of drugs have failed them and that's a situation that you have a lot of work to do to get them even ready for the CAR-T therapy. Now I always tell my patients that you really don't know when the ideal window of therapy was until it's just a little too late and you've missed it. So uh, that uh, remains a challenge. 
Um, but Sarah, of course, you've taken the opposite approach in the study you've just published, which is you've got a cohort of patients that you've taken to CAR T and first remission on ibrutinib who've got really spectacular results after CAR. I mean, I know the number's quite small and I'm sure even you want to see longer follow-up, but those results look really spectacular. Yeah, so six of the patients actually were um, on first line ibrutinib had been diagnosed. Largely, they had poor risk features. They had been diagnosed with CLL. They were being controlled on ibrutinib. They were not in a, in a CR, but they were in a PR or, or stable disease on ibrutinib. And that gave us plenty of time to manufacture them. This, I often say, John, this is one of the easiest clinical trials I've ever done. They were so stable and there was time to manufacture the cells. And, you know, so I think um, that's a real plus, actually, which often isn't really captured on um, uh, essentially intent to treat analyses uh, or, or per protocol analyses. So, so that's a big plus. And um, I know that conservatively the right answer is that uh, you know, you sort of wait for the right window. But, I, but I've been very encouraged. Yes, small number of patients. I would love personally, my own personal opinion, I would love to see newly diagnosed patients with high risk features getting ibrutinib, getting manufactured and getting what has in some patients been a one and done treatment. Yeah, we were asked questions about the economics of this whole thing and of course for people who are going to be on you know frontline uh, ibrutinib patients can be on the drug for many years actually a CAR T approach potentially curative in that setting actually could uh, work out to be financially advantageous. I know we're moving more and more towards fixed duration rather than continuous therapy, but on a patient who is going to be on continuous therapy, or even on a patient who's going to be on intermittent combinations of ibrutinib and venetoclax, you could quite easily make the financial case that the CAR-T becomes a reasonable approach here, yeah? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing more than more fixed duration than CAR-T, <laughs> as long as you have the right safety profile, and of course you need the efficacy. So. That's why bringing CAR T to early lines of therapy is really important, either in combination with other novel agents or, or, or uh, thinking about sequencing novel agents and CAR T in a fixed duration of time early uh, on. And, uh, but again, we need to get much better in terms of both efficacy and safety profile for a disease like CLL. Now, what a lot of my patients talk to me about is, oh, could we not just freeze my cells now? Um, there are issues I know in terms of using a previously cryopreserved product to then manufacture, but you, you guys have done this many times before, oh, right? It's, it's very doable. So what, what we're talking about, I guess, is that you identify a patient or a patient self-identifies as someone who's willing and interested to do that. And of course, I mean, there's some, um, there's some sort of um, background for doing that both in the CAR T cell world as well as in people who want to freeze their cord blood cells, right? I mean, that, that does happen and that is a choice that we give them uh, in some situations. So I, I think it is doable as to whether that is going to be acceptable and translatable to a product that a drug company will sign off and say, yes, this is the same as what has been done in our studies. That's a different story. Um, but we have done that and, and particularly uh, uh, across the road at the Children's Hospital, that's being done quite often. Yeah, of course, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're then freezing the cells and you've got your chain of command because you're doing it at the center that the manufacturing is then happening. It's a different issue when you're having the cells cryopreserved in one place and then given to a company someplace else. The, the whole regulatory issues uh, raise, raise their heads then. But I do want to come back and talk, of course, about what you talked about today. A little, little bit of a standout of the whole session, but very interesting talk nonetheless, of course, using the CD20 rather than the CD19 car. And of course, the other interesting thing you're doing there is a, a third generation car, that is with a, both a CD28 and a 41BB uh, co-stimulation. So you don't want to just kind of tell us you know, why it is you're you're interested in this approach and why you're excited about the studies you've got so far? Of course, so CD20 is, is a proven target in CLL. So the, in the US, at least all three monoclonal antibodies targeting CD20 are FD, approved by FDA for treatment of CLL. We use it concurrently with venetoclax and of course with chemotherapy, it gave us the overall survival advantage. So the idea of using a CD20 directed car in CLL makes a lot of sense. Now it's a third generation car, so uh, the, the hope was at the time time of the, the design to get the benefit of the both co-assimilatory molecules of CD28 and 41BB. In clinic though, we are seeing that this car is behaving very similar to 41BB cars. Uh, but yeah, so the study is ongoing and this is a study that uh, started uh, at Fred Hodge and we are including patients with CD20 positive B-cell lymphomas including CLL. 
Most of our experience so far is in non-CLL BNHLs and... Um, uh, Although I hold on to that 100% response rate you've got in your one CLL patient, one. yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is for what's going on in the field, as it was mentioned, in cell therapy and non-cell therapy uh, for CLL. There has been uh, competition even for other cars. Now, we have a number of patients in this study and hopefully in future meetings we'll present more data on CLL patients, but in general what we showed is that it's an outpatient car and so far small number of patients we have seen uh, promising safety profile we have not seen grade three or four uh, cytokine release syndrome or ICANS again we need to treat more patients and get more experience and so far effective in indolent lymphoma is like follicular lymphoma and again limited experience in other histology so the study is now uh, moving to the next level of having a multi-center study and we have some other uh, academic sites involved with a dedicated cohort for CLL. So we're really looking forward to treating more patients and um, as you mentioned, the one patient we treated has had a great response with deep uh, undetectable measurable residual disease and, uh, and in almost a year in remission. So, you know, we have shown that NO1 works, but of course there's a long way to go, but uh, we're just looking forward to having the next study. Sure. Now, the whole, of course, or one, well, there's lots of differences between CD28 and 41BB, but one issue seems to be this issue of persistence of the CAR T cells. In ALL, we've got very clear data that persistence matters. In diffuse large B cell lymphoma, a lot more controversial as to whether it matters quite so much or not, but a lot of that might just be the methodology of picking up some residual CARs. Of course, CLL fits somewhere in between. It's classified as a lymphoma, but it's got that leukemic component. Pretty much all the published data I've seen has actually been with 41BB cars. I can't think of any studies that have got a pure CD28 car than which I've seen any data. So it's very hard for us to know whether persistence really is an important feature or not. But I guess from the PEN studies would suggest that you're usually seeing in those long-term remitters persistence. We do. And so, and, and you're right, I think we, ca we just can't disentangle those, particularly because the expectation is that ALL will relapse a lot faster than CLL. And so that, that might be why we just don't have that signal. Personally, and again, it's a feeling without a control, but I think it, persistence is important. Um, and um, well, you know, I think biologically, CLL, of course, you know, clinical behavior, we think of it more as a lymphoma. I wonder a little bit about whether the cell of origin is important, and the cell of origin in CLL, I imagine, will be closer to a differentiated B cell than, it, than to ALL. Um, so I can't biologically tell you that there's a good reason why persistence should be important in CLL, um, but, what's, but, but uh, you know, what's making it difficult for us to discern a signal is just the latency to, to relapse if there, if there was to be one. Um, having said that, again, we don't, they always correlate. Persistence of CAR T cells with B cell aplasia in CLL. So we just, we can't answer that question. Sure. Now, of course, it was interesting, at least for me, to see that when you've got the 41BB and the CD28, you did see persistence of the CAR suggesting, at least to me, and see if you agree, that the 41BB component does, you know, it does there. And we don't see, if you like, a CD28 driven exhaustion of the cells that leads to, you know, the loss of those cells as long as the 41BB domain is also there. Any thoughts? And do you think this is going to be important in terms of looking at these other B cell malignancies having persistence? I think so. I mean, one could argue that for, for indolent lymphomas, including CLL, actually persistence does matter. I mean, having initial response is not difficult. The reason we can't cure these conditions is that they come back. And the question is, with, uh, if you're really looking at, if looking at the competitive landscape and if you're really trying to beat uh, in a good way some other targeted drugs that we have, we really need to see uh, progression-free survival of reasonable time of three, four, five years. So how much that persistent CAR-T helps you, I mean, I, I would say it does, but it also comes with the cost of B-cell depletion and, 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 and infections, and so it's very important to have long-term information on those toxicities as well. So I'm gonna end with just one last question that I know you cannot answer because we had the company in the room, we tried to get the answer from them and couldn't, but it is frustrating that we still don't have a commercial product we are able to offer our patients for these diseases, um, for, you know, it's like CLL already. So 
any kind of thoughts as to how realistic you think? How close are we? Are we, are we, are we getting close? Are we still years away? What's, what more is it going to take? I can't answer that question, but I would like to believe that it that it will be soon. I, th I mean, the data you need the data of safety and the data of efficacy, and and uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. So there you have it. Uh, we're there with the world's experts talking about the role of CAR T cells in CLL. I think, as I already mentioned, the first disease in which we actually saw the efficacy of these cells. Lots of interest, uh, lots of ways in which we're able to add other agents in to modulate, lots of ways we can think about manipulating the CAR-T product to get what we're looking for, and potentially a disease where we would be looking to give the CAR-T cells with an agent like ibrutinib. So thinking about one of the model diseases in which we'll be thinking about a dual approach and how to treat the patients. So like all of you, I'm looking forward to the rest of the meeting and I'm really looking forward to following up to this session next year at our next CAR-T meeting where we'll see where the field has taken us in CLL. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you both for joining me today.